Hello, everyone. My name is Mark from the Misplay Podcast, and you're listening to Eternal Journey, everyone's favorite eternal podcast. Welcome to Eternal Journey, the podcast. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Eternal Journey, the podcast that talks about all things eternal with a focus on limited play. I'm your host, Jedi. This is episode 96 of the podcast, where we are going to be giving you our first impressions of the Empire of Glass Limited format. Speaking of us, I want to introduce my good friends that join me every week on the podcast. First up, we have John Olio. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, Jedi. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Happy to be here, man. Happy to be here. Sitting across from us on the internet, our other good friend, Darth underscore Herman 2, a.k.a. Alex. How you doing, buddy? Hey, doing good. What's up, guys? Welcome back, Jedi. Feels like I haven't talked to you in forever. Right? Uh, vacation will do that. It's funny how when someone's gone on vacation, it seems like they've been gone forever, but the person on vacation feels like it flew by, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, let's go ahead and cut with a little bit of housekeeping real quick, and then we'll dive right into it. Twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ, where you can catch me streaming every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. And of course, you can catch draft videos on the internet at YouTube.com slash Eternal Journey, where you can catch draft videos, constructive videos, and the occasional, uh, you know, video podcast and whatnot. Doing some shout outs. Want to give a big shout out to the entire eternal community for supporting our charity tournament the peasant tournament that went on a couple weeks ago it was a fundraiser for the child's play charity as the community we came together and generated almost twelve hundred dollars to donate so i think that's absolutely fantastic congratulations to everyone that participated and everyone that showed up to spectate and everyone that pushed along the content uh, 46 players played in total, so that is fantastic. A great showing with a top four consisting of Spifferific, Collector, Apple Chips, and Batteries. So thank you guys so much for that. And then, of course, a great thank you to the great people at Team Eternal Journey because of everyone working behind the scenes and it being an extremely smooth uh, tournament that was enjoyable for both the viewers and the players. So thank you guys for that. Everyone sacrificing time. Uh, various times of their weekend throughout the uh the world to make that happen and then finally a shout out and thank you to cassandrath and direwolf digital both contributing to the prize support to uh, make sure that the people that competed and did well performed well got to receive a little something something but of course the true winners of it are the kids that uh are gonna get some cool game consoles and games and stuff to help them deal with their uh dire needs and whatnot as they're getting long-term treatment in uh, facilities. So thank you guys so much that I want to help make that happen. And then of course, a shout out to Telemachus for hosting the Tuesday Night Eternal series that is back on the map. So you have some competitive fill up until uh, Direwolf makes an announcement, as well as coming up with some new tournaments. We just had a recent team battle which was super fun to commentate and spectate so shout out to telemachus for making that happen on tuesday night eternal but all right guys that's gonna do it so let's dive into our pack one pick one first up we have Razorbot. this is a one one deadly grenade and rodent for one shadow we have bring into focus a two justice fast spell draw a justice sigil from your deck Amplify 3, draw an additional Justice Sigil from your deck. Battlefield Chanter is a 3-2 Mystic Soldier for 3 time. Summon, play a Synchronized Strike, which gives all your units plus 1 plus 1 this turn. Oni Hybrid is a 3-1 Oni Valkyrie for 4 Double Fire with Flying. Summon, draw a weapon from your Void. Emerald Overcharger is a 2 Justice Relic says summon give a unit plus two plus two this turn pay one and sacrifice emerald overcharger to give a unit plus two plus two this turn sire's beckonings next which is a slow spell for three justice play two one one valkyries with flying 
than a card that is in uh, contention for one of the biggest uh, argumentative cards here is Little C. This is a 0-2 Mandrake for one Primal Ultimate. When you start your turn with Little Seed for the fifth time, it gets plus five, plus five, and Overwhelm. Create making a 5-7 Overwhelming Mandrake. Blood Boil Executioner is next. It's a 3-2 Valkyrie for five of fire. It has flying and has charge. Going into our uncommons, we have Nectar of Unlife. This is a two shadow spell with decay, deal two damage. Then amplify three, draw a unit from your void. It gets decay and void bound. Personal favorite of mine is Deathwing. This is a 2-3 Valkyrie for 3 Argentport. Flying Deadly Lifesteal. Valkyrie Warp. The top weapon of your deck gets Deadly and Lifesteal. Of course, Valkyrie Warp means that if you have a Valkyrie in play, you can warp this card into play off the top of your deck for additional value. Root, R Root Ripper is our final uncommon it is a 2-2 mandrake for four double primal when root ripper attacks your mandrakes get plus one attack and overwhelm permanently summon transform another unit into a 3-3 mandrake and it could be either your unit or your opponent's unit and then finally rounding off the pack at the rare slot is sharp tactician this is a 2-2 minotaur soldier for four double justice summon Silence another unit. Sharp a Tactician gets plus two, plus two for each battle skill it had. So if you silence a unit with flying, Sharp a Tactician will be a 4-4. Four, four. You silence Deathwing, for example, that has flying, deadly, and lifesteal, it will get it or it will be an 8-8 eight, eight as it gets a plus two plus two for flying, another two two for deadly, and another plus two plus two for lifesteal. All right, so that is the pack. John, why don't you tell us what are you looking at in this pack and why? Sure. Uh, this is this is a very good pack, right? Like, I, I think any of these uncommons and the rare can easily be argued for here. Um, and I think it's a matter of, like, meta preferences, personal preferences, and draft risk, I guess. But I think for me... It's closest between the Sharp Tactician and the Nectar of Unlife. Even though, like, Deathwing is the most, I don't know, potent card, maybe, as far as offensive and defensive capabilities. Like, you know, it's the whole two color thing, first pick and whatnot. Like, but Nectar of Unlife, like, that's a card I'd flash even in most decks. So, like, that's probably the safest pick one here for me. But I, I think sharp tactician is just great um and i love playing justice in the format so far uh so i think that would be my pick here okay yeah i agree with pretty much everything you said i think i would still end up taking nectar of unlife because it's easy to splash because you want to play it later but it's removal on the front end and like you said it's just great love you, nectar. you pretty much covered it yep alex where are you at in this pack and why yes yeah, so like john said it like any one of those top row cards can be a first pick easily um and i'm leaning towards the nectar just because it's earlier removal if you need it it keeps you more open it's definitely a more safe pick but still a very good card late game um so yeah slight edge to that one for me and the second would be the tactician yeah, Tactician can be an absolute powerhouse. Just getting to silence, sometimes effectively being a removal for a unit and making a 4-4 or 6-6 is very powerful. You ever seen this card show up in uh, Constructed now that they did that uh, Jander David promo? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, th I think, I think that's the correct. Nectar is the, the correct pick. <laughs> I mean, I've I've definitely slammed Sharp Tactician in a draft for sure, no doubt about it. I've never had it be bad. It's it's just been so so good every time. It's like always at least a four four. Like takes out their one guy that was getting in. But yeah, I mean, Nectar is basically the same thing. Takes out their like flyer or whatever while getting back your best unit that was that they managed to kill. Like mm -hmm. what a what a great effect. Yep, no doubt about it. 
All right then, well guys, that was our pack one pick one. So let's go ahead and dive into the format and our first impressions. The first thing we're gonna be talking about is breaking down the tribes or the um, projected synergies, I guess, for each faction. First off, we're gonna start off with Fire, Primal, Shadow, Grenadines, which can go, you can go tri-faction this format if you want to, if you value the fixing aggressively in these packs. And then you have access to things like Bannerman, and symbol or uh well you do have symbols as well but uh paintings and seek powers but i think firmly i'm still firmly in the two faction camp because i just man the shuffler will just ruin me sometimes unless i have somewhere of about five to six pieces of fixing i, I don't like splashing unless it's an absolute like paras card now i don't think it's wrong either because i've seen plenty of well versed and solid drafters easily splash cards and sometimes even train wreck their deck to splash cards and it's worked out for them so uh, i think it's very feasible but uh the two versions here of grenadines you can go fire primal i.e scry uh, sky scry crag sky crag which is a more go wide style where you're trying to go as wide as possible and kind of go around your opponent's defenses to deal damage you have some synergies with things like cyberhound and whatnot and then obviously you have access to Steam Blast. And then you have the more sacrifice centric version of it. It's still kind of go wide, but you're trying to get your value off of sacking units for potential value. And this is the uh, fire primal version to a certain extent, but mostly the fire shadow is what I like. The stone scars where I feel this really fits into it because you have things like grizzly contest and devour to kind of get additional value out of it. Um, John, why don't you go ahead and dabble in, uh, tell us what you think of these Grenadine decks. Um, so I keep hearing people say this, um, and this is basically my experience too, it's kind of hard for this one to come together. And like, like when it does, it can definitely be very powerful. Um, I think one of the reasons that it comes together less uh, is, you know, we've kind of, we, we ran the numbers and uh, Grenadine has the fewest uh, cards that's you know that are granted the type granted in or make a granted in you know I, and all these counts I'm, I'm including just cards that maybe a spell that makes a unit of that type straight up or whatever but only the commons and uncommons so there's only 14 of those in empire of glass um mm -hmm. so you know i just you, you're that's the, the the lowest number of any of these um tribes as far as the first pack so like i think that maybe that's like driving this uh difficulty of getting in there um, to these to this faction because like primal is one of the factions and that's typically like one of the more open factions in the drafts but you're still like maybe not seeing the grenadine and right like it, we've talked about this already um like one of the things in in the drafts is you know whether your factions are open but like the whole whole another question is whether or not your your tribes are open right so but yeah so uh grenadine it's it's somewhere in between those three factions, right? Fire, Primal, and Shadow. And it's kind of weird because go wide, you know, on the one hand, you want um, payoffs for going wide, right? Like rally effects and things like that. But then sacrifice is like directly at odds with that, right? In a, in a way, right? Because you're reducing your board when you have to sacrifice. But I, I, I know, I get why the one feeds the other, but... I don't know, it's kind of like an awkward strategy in that way, right? Like anytime you anytime you're having to sacrifice things, like the the payoffs really better be worth it, right? Like we've had prior draft formats where sacrifice was uh you know, it, 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 the deck would have to be so synergistic for it to be worth it, right? Um Are you guys having similar experience? What what's going on with with your Grenadine, <laughs> Alex? I mean, for me Grenadine hasn't been something that's really worked too much and the one that i think is the best and i've had the most success with is the one it definitely has fire fire's like been the most color by the best color by far for me so it's the the stone scar one has a the combust card as well in the draft packs really kind of helps that deck you know really work so the go wide one the the red blue signpost grenadine from the empire of glass set i whatever the you know 
the card I'm talking about, guys. Help me out here. Grub, grub, grub hound the, or whatever. The grub, grub oh, hopper, the, grub hound. Sorry, no, you're right. Yeah, the, I'm thinking of the rare. It's cyber hound and then grub bot, grub bot, grub, grub bot. bot. There you go. The so one? I've, like that, yeah, the treasure one. I've seen that one go off in a uh, you know sky crag deck. If you can get a few of those guys and then just kind of go off with that, um, but. Other than that, I have not been impressed. And mostly, like John said it, there's it's like the fewest units, you know? It's also the tribe, like there, there's also some like spell damage thing going on in the tribe too. It's like a little bit of everything. It's, you know, it seems it's like kind of muddled as far as the theme. Like it's, it, it's not aggroed either, right? You don't like the Fire Primal Grenadine deck wants you to kind of be more of like a value control y deck. Is that right? Y- yeah. What's your experience, Jedi? I have yet to draft Skycrag. Not even going to lie. And it makes me extremely disappointed because of the fact that Mighty Strikes is in the format. And I have yet to play it. Um, I, I think the deck... Really, I honestly feel like the deck, you just want to get in chip damage. And then get a really good swing in there with that Cyberhound as a, a 3-3 Berserk. And then throw on like a Scythe or a Mighty Strikes to win. Um, but I, I can't speak about that deck. I agree with you guys. I think it's a little too hard to get into it unless you kind of force it. And then when you're in it, I mean, I maybe I don't know. I I like I like Stone Scar because the Grenadines are just kind of like the fodder. They they give you some extra value. They make more than one unit off a card. But then you're running things like Metal Fang that really puts you in there. The five four flyer that uh, can get life steal and charge and flying. You got it mentioned when you sack it. Yeah, that's and it. then, and then you have Thorn Beast and or and Dire Beast in the draft packs that give you value for sacking your Grenadines, and then much like you mentioned, Combust. Uh, you have Nectar of Unlife. You have Combust. You have Grizzly Contest. To you, you and end then up with the best removal in those two colors. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And then if you can pick up a couple of shoal dredgers that you're feeding your void anyway. So I think that's why I like Stone Scar the most when it comes to this like grenade and sack thing. You, you just have so many ways of capitalizing on this sack fodder and making more than one unit. So yeah, I like Stone Scar. I, I have zero experience with uh, Sky Crag. I have but, never right. done Felm either. I guess there could be a Felm version of it, but. I haven't seen it. Yeah, my film deck was just straight film. Like, it just mid-range film. Nothing too impressive or, or special about it. All right. Moving along, next up we have Soldiers, which is Time, Justice, and Primal. Uh, there's an Elysian version, which I have not seen much success with, neither on my side of the board or my opponent. Uh Pretty much Huru is the one that really kind of stands out with it being the Amplify Soldiers and really capitalizing on turning your smaller soldiers into bigger units. You have access to MVP of the format anytime you're in Justice, which is uh, Martial Efficiency. Part is just amazing. Uh, solid drafter like Extinction. Even essentially, I think they had like a Felm deck or something and they splashed just for two Martial Efficiencies. So take that in consideration. Uh, so weapons matter and fire. Uh, uh, correction, I'm sorry. Uh, stun matters is the justice primal one. So the Huru thing, I have. I tried to make that work with one deck. Uh, it was on stream, so we were trying to go deep. And once again, my luck struck. And I had the stun effects without the kill effects, or I had the kill effects without the stuns. And yes. And then time... Primal, once again, going back to Legion being muster, lol. I mean, I saw one person go off on it because they drafted like three. It's uh, it's because of like the Cobra Gears and then there's like that, the the three five and the draft packs is like 20 times boosted or whatever. Yeah. The muster guy. Yeah, I don't know. I, and he's a soldier. Yeah. Like, I, I've, I like Kuru. I, I'm not as aggressive in it as some of the other people are. I don't try to go into it. I pick it up, and if I get there, I do, because we'll talk about that later on when we're doing the overview. But 
I, I, I naturally, I don't know if it's my play style or what. I don't do very well with synergy decks. I'm, I'm boring, but like I said, we'll talk about it when we get there. John, where are you at as far as this soldier decks go? So, like, the thing with the soldier deck is, um, it, it's one of the easier ones to play the three colors if you end up with enough good cards or whatever, because time is one of the colors and bannerman is one of the soldiers, right? So it just kind of and. Uh, on top of that, it also has the most units that are soldiers out of, out of all five of the tribes for Empire of Glass. And it seems like every other unit you randomly pick up in the draft packs is a soldier. Like, there's just a lot of soldiers. So as far as, like, if you get, like, um, you know, an early garrison or whatever that buffs soldiers, that's e- an easier thing to build around. It's when you start getting into, like, you just mentioned the the Huru payoff, like, stun matter stuff and, like... You know, it's 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 uh it's easy to do kind of soldiers with amplify in general, um, but when you when you start doing like a double synergy deck, it gets a little weird. I mean, I, it can work, but it's like you're kind of, you know, at the mercy of two different things of drawing in the wrong order, which which can be very awkward. But, um, you know, it's easy to just have some incidental synergies and just good cards, right? In this kind of deck, um. And like I said, it's one of the easier ones to run three colors. Uh, you're still better off, you know, in in any of these generally picking just two of the colors, right? We're, but we're they like across all five tribes, they kind of you know span the three colors basically, and and can go any of the any of the pairs there, right? Um, I think soldiers has been. <laughs> I keep wanting to, you know, go a little too hard on the synergy with them, and you, you end up, like, it's a pitfall, but, like, man, when it pops off, it pops off, and it's fun, um, and I keep, see, you know, seeing people do some powerful stuff with it. Um, it's a cool tribe. It's it's easy to get into, um, but it doesn't yeah. have fire, so it's a little lacking in the fire department. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest issue with that is, is exactly, you're minus Mavelof Elite, I feel like most of the cards you're going to run in that deck to get that whole Amplify stun synergy are, is going to be slightly under par. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the 1-1 one, one that could become a 4-4. Four, four. I get it. That's super cool. And like you mentioned, when you get Call of Arms and, and it everything pops off, like you feel like you're king of the world, that's awesome. But I definitely feel if you don't get your stuff in line... That it could definitely nip you in the butt. Uh, for the most part, something like Hardiness that gives you two health for the turn and you can amplify for one. We've seen that uh, actually perform better than it seems. But there are some times when it's underwhelming as well. So you just got to kind of make do with what you got. Uh, like I said, I the deck, high highs and low lows. And then a little less in between, personally. Alex, where are you at on the Soldier decks? I like the uh, pack one, pick one in the relic that boosts all your soldiers, and that being the reason I fall into this deck. Right. Um, can't remember the name of that card, of course. But uh, Bastion Garrison. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it goes with uh, you know both of the things because it has amplify matters, and then it just pumps all your dudes. Which a lot of times are kind of weenie-ish, you know, potentially. So that just really makes your not so good army into a good army. So I've had some success because of that with Combray in these colors. Yeah, on on that note, I I really like Sen for the reserves. I think that that card continues yes. to I, that card. I can't say it impresses me because it does exactly what we expected it to do, but it's really good. Like just being able to play it whenever you want in your curve, it buys you time. If you're behind, it can stabilize you. If you're close to parity, it can allow you to go wide enough to win the game. You get some extra synergies with the amplify. That card is really solid. I mean, I've lost a couple of times because of it as well, because you are putting a two, one in play that your opponent can uh, attack into or overwhelm, etc. But yeah, I, I, I'm still very comfortable with my grade with that card. I, I like that card quite a bit. I think I need to probably start valuing it a little bit higher than I'm doing right now because I have let one or two go by, and I feel like maybe having it just, you know, you fire off two of these things in a game, even one for four and then one for three guys. I, I feel like you're really starting to get ahead. So 
I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, if you do have the Bastion Garrison, then you're just going to go off in a huge way because now you're adding extra guys to the board and they're all three twos instead. Um, yeah. But yeah. John, do you have uh, anything to add? Uh, a Legion real quick. I, I've tried to make a Legion work a couple times, both with Flyers and just the Amplify deck, and something about it just doesn't come together, and I can't really put my finger on it. I don't know why. Maybe just time doesn't have enough for the primal to pick up the slack and the support i'm not really sure but i haven't been impressed with the elysian version i actively try not to be in it when i can it's uh i mean you're missing like the usual flyer package so you just got to have that in mind when you're you know you, you can't just default like to certain elysian cards you would normally draft or you'll you'll end up just having a weird deck yeah fair enough Next up, we have the one of the two boogeymen in the format, and that is Fire, Justice, Shadow, or Ambition. This is the Valkyrie kind of archetype. You can either go straight up Rockano, which kind of really values weapons going onto your unit. Um, you could play the Argentport version that kind of looks at Relic weapons a little heavier. And then finally, you have the uh just kind of the hybrid of the two with all three factions main things here is that you're capitalizing on the fact that valkyries all have evasion and we have quite a few that have berserk and charge and get weapons back so you're not only getting an evasive threat that you're normally paying a little more for some understated units to kind of make it happen but the fact that they all have uh relevant text on them whether it's deadly war cry get a weapon back berserk plunder really kind of puts it together it also has a cheap form of valkyrie emulator so you have even though it's only a one two it's still an evasive unit with plunder that goes in any deck to help your fixing and it allows you to really capitalize on things like malaga munitions pumping up two of your flyers so just that extra two attack and it synergizes very well with um scythe slash because plus four overwhelm and plunder you throw that on like your for example your stone hammer all of a sudden now you're doing six damage or 12 damage to your opponent that they were not expecting and they're lower on life total they expected so really solid uh, you i think this this one's pretty easy to go into there's a lot of valkyries running around that people aren't really picking up and just getting flyers you also can supplement the deck with things like side street monitor which is a sentinel but it's still a fantastic flyer because it has it's two one for three which is about par for course but also gains regen which is extremely powerful and you have various funder plunder effects with the three one uh, gatekeeper which is also sentinel but once again like just because you're the valkyrie deck doesn't mean every card in your deck is a valkyrie because this is limited so let's start off with you alex where are you at on these valkyrie to type decks well, so i just went and looked and my last 10 drafts in a row have been like in these three colors in some way um so it's like really easy to be in these colors because i think they have the most playables i mean you can call it valks but it's like even without even really having any valk synergies you know a lot of your units are valks um but yeah i think this combination is where it's at as far as the best colors and the best cards the uh, most commons that are playables um in both the first and last pack and the draft packs so I mean, that's my experience with these colors so far. I don't know about John. Yeah, these are the, this is the uh, faction of winning, right? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You get both yeah, the evasive units, uh, the you know, and the efficient good removal at common and uncommon, right? Like, in, in all three of those colors. You get your nectars and your send to markets and your chars and all that juicy stuff. And, like, yeah, it's there are some Valk Matter cards maybe in your deck, but you just don't even care, right? Some things happen to have Valkorp or whatever. And if it happens one time, you're like, oh, sweet. And the rest of the time, you just don't even think about it, and it doesn't matter. Because you're just winning. Yeah. Yeah, Rakano's where it's at. You, like you said, you get access to Laser Blast, you get access to Send to Market, Send to Market, and you get access to uh, Basher, Auto Tread. Like, it, it's, yeah. 
it, <laughs> we're talking about some <laughs> some sentinel cards there but you know it's like so much overlap they, they directly overlapped in rakano right I mean, it just is. Plain and simple, Rakano is the strongest faction pairing, I think. And I have no problem saying that because you just... It's one of the deeper color pairings, I think, right? A lot more playables where you end up cutting some cards versus trying to be like, oh, what can I scrounge up to put it together? And yeah, when you're in it, you're in it. And and cards that just work, like Blood Bowl Executioner is surprisingly good when you're able to keep pressure on your opponent and play flyers and play a big five five where they race they spend resources to get it down um if you're a little heavier on the flyers then laser blast is a little less effective because normally that those have smaller health pools that they could use to deal damage but i mean either yeah. way you still have send the market and you just sometimes being able to use a slash scythe slash to get over their blocker and do damage to their face is still good enough as well definitely uh, i think send the market is great even with a in a format that you have people have more access to the market it still feels like unconditional removal and a lot of the times the opponent just can't play really around it because there's so few things you can do about it so and even if they do have we've said it before if they go to the market and they have to get that card back then they're not getting whatever card they had initially in their market and we're fine with that as well Moving along is this is a very synergistic kind of uh, tribe which can have some seriously high payoffs. But man, is it easy to derail your draft if it is not open? Um, and this is Mandrakes. This is Time Primal Shadow Mandrakes. Uh, the more popular one being Xenon, but I have seen people have some success with the. Uh, film version to an extent as well um, the xenon version is pretty much relying on ultimate it doesn't matter what ultimate it is as long as an ultimate happens so the unit doesn't have to be a um, a mandrake but it does pump all your mandrakes you get things like lifesteal and plus one attack and overwhelm and create other mandrakes and give your mandrakes killer so when this thing goes off it goes off and this is not really a big mandrake synergistic card but shoal dredger is a phenomenal card being able to get it down to somewhere between the three to four cost range for a seven six is fantastic and the fact that it will get all these bonuses from the additional mandrake ultimate is fantastic so yeah i i like when it comes together it's super powerful I'm not gonna lie but man do you need those uncommons to make this card uh, this deck come together right uh jo john john wh wh where, where are you at on mandrakes all variations of it yeah a lot of them are a little a little weak right without the synergy um and so like you just mentioned it's it's all about these uh it's all about the powerful mandrake on commons i think if you really want them to like pop off <laughs> and like man have i seen some opponents do some some crazy mandrake stuff i think somebody did alex dirty yesterday i think with some at one point um they just like suddenly they're just huge amounts of attack power and all deadly and whatever it's not that hard i mean we've all seen it in constructed it's it's actually not you know crazy to get that going in draft um because you know if it's open you'll notice because you'll you're getting past these uh dual color um uncommons right and then you can just kind of feed into that synergy and uh yeah, it's uh, 16, 16 Mandrakes in the, in the Eternity Packs. And then there's actually, like, a good amount of, like, you know, if you go to the Ultimates Matter side, there's a, they, they have a good amount of um, Synergy cards in the uh, Draft Packs for, you know, that just happen to do Ultimates. And yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. And, like, it, it's hard to be in the Self Mill deck, or, you know, because one of the big payoffs is that card you just mentioned, the Shoal Dredger. And I think... Any deck playing Shadow is just down to play Shoal Dredger, basically. In the format, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I, I, it's a card that you know, when you're done drafting, sometimes you do cut it from your Shadow deck. Um, but <laughs> it's like just a generally good draft card. So like that's one of the payoffs, and like every deck is fighting for that a little bit if you're in Shadow. So there's a little tension there, but and there's there's other payoffs too. But it's 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 a little like Soldiers in that your deck can just look weak in a lot of games when you don't draw the cards or 
maybe like the key piece got removed right before you got to do the payoff or something. And then you're just left with an anemic board. Um, the, that can happen. The one thing I, I will say about the film version is that having access to Root Ripper is solid. Uh, I think that's a good card. But then also, because of things like Wretched Raven and Darkwater, uh, right? Darkwater, Sweetwater Vine, Darkwater Dark Vine. Vines. Yeah. The it's surprisingly it's not easy but it's easier to trigger out oh, and sunset priest to get a cheap what is it man eater man eater drake mandrake the 8 8 overwhelm that goes from eight to two right hmm. you guys know which one i'm talking about or no i'm, I'm, a, I'm the primal I'm a one bit. yeah i know what you're talking yeah, about i just saw yeah that. Yeah, uh, it's fine. I'll guy. look it up. But uh, uh, but the other thing too about mandrakes, which it's not really a big mandrake thing, they're just solid. Uh, at the four drop slot, the Goliath flytrap, the three five summon plunder, and then ultimate at the start of your next turn, or at the start of your turn, so the next turn you play it, play a silence. That's a really great card. A little bit slower than Caravan Guard, but the three five body is still very relevant. The plunder at turn four, I think it gives you a good idea of whether you need more power or you need the treasure to dig. And then the silence, like we talked about, there's enough utility units in this format with battle skills on them where the plunder or correction, the silence can be a very solid removal spell and it's a good way to trigger wormstone as well as well as obviously a free ultimate that you don't have to go out of your way at all to trigger and then pollen sprayer of three five is great and a one five is pretty close to it with so many x ones in this format and not enough things that could really push through that five health um, and then, of course, this ultimate actually buffs all your units, not just your Mandrake. So that's two things to consider there that kind of puts you in there a little bit better. And then where is it? Uh, Rose Bloom Mandrake. There you go. That is the 6-6 six, six Overwhelm for 8 Primal. But then if you have uh, 10 cards or more, or the enemy player has 10 cards or more in their void, then this goes down to only costing 2. Then, of course, you can supplement it with things like gassy perfume to give it deadly or er, correction killer and regen and stuff like that so uh dark water vines i don't think it's a windmill slam i'm, not, I'm still not as high on it as other people are but i do think that the fact that it could be a 2-1 with regen makes it a little bit better than it looks on the surface just because it could chump block well and it could attack decent if you have some ways to supplement it but yeah overall mandrakes very high reward but very high risk as well because you can just kind of have like a subpar Mandrake deck and it, it just doesn't come together the way you want to. I think a card that um, kind of helps you in this direction because it's a very easy pack one pick one is like a Vine Grafter. Because it's like a, it's just a really good Mandrake. And then also the card that's going to let you bring two of them back. So if you're like opponents just trading off Mandrakes, you know expect the with the shoal dredgings is that what that card is shoal stir uh, stirrings shoal stirrings there you go um yeah those two cards are and then xenon is probably the best but i think um if you can get all three colors and the fixing for that then is when the deck is really really good potentially uh the other cool thing too as well is just the fact that you have that mandrake simulacra which is just perfectly fine granted it's at the four drop slot again so really can just at the four drop slot but that card easily goes in any deck and it's a cheap ultimate you pay one to ultimate this thing so it's really easy to kind of play an ultimate the same turn or kind of judge when you want to ultimate it to trigger all your mandrake so that's another good little payoff there that i think that card does work in any deck and it's a safe pick like you can take it and even if you're not the mandrake deck it's still going to do work so all right and then finally that takes us into what we alluded to earlier with is sentinels and this is going to be in uh fire time and justice so creation john why don't you go ahead and lead us out on the sentinel kind of tribes yeah we're used to you know praxis sentinels right and like that's definitely a thing in this format um and you can you know you can do traditional kind of ramp uh but like that's not usually the way people uh tend to do sentinels because i think the strongest sentinel deck in the format is like racino sentinels right like you're just smashing people you get like all the overstatted 
units all the way up the curve um, in the draft packs. I can't remember the name of them, but it's like a, a 4-4, you know, charge guy, like with the, the Sentinel ally. Um, if you're getting those guys, your deck is just going to run people. Raider. Out. Yeah, the Temple Raider, right? Uh, yep, Temple Raider. Man. Okay, and there's also 18 Sentinels in, in the, you know, so it's it's the second most as far as the the number of support uh, cards that support Sentinel strategies or whatever. And like they're the Sentinel matter cards are more important than like the Valk matter cards or something like that. Like you mentioned laser blast, man, when you get to play that for one, it's like a big deal as far as, you know, tempo in a game of limited, like that lets you fit it in on your curve so much easier. Um, and Sentinels tend to be, uh, you know, big butt units, but like, you know the bread and butter of of any of those sentinel decks is uh tends to be either what bastion garrison the three one um if you're uh justice sentinels in any way and then of course you know the boogeyman or whatever the format I, in some ways uh basher you just got to have an answer for basher right in your deck yeah five five reckless discard a card went summon discard a card and it only costs three and a fire yeah, Barricade Basher. Like, if you haven't run into that card, you haven't played draft in this format yet, I think. Well, then you also have Red Plate Crasher, right? Yeah, the curve uh, is just so good. Like, the twos, threes... If you if your deck is nothing but... um, What's the two-drop one? The two drop one that has the Fate trigger, right? Um, That that guy is just... It's just a 2-2, two -two, but man, it's just, he's just so good. So if, you, if your deck is nothing but those are Bastion Garrisons, and then Crashers and Bashers, and Laser Blasts and whatever, man... You're just gonna run people over, like the the, uh, the cash, right? Yeah, roaming mm -hmm. cash. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I like the Sentinel deck is like the curve is just you, you can just see it a mile away. You know, it's like oh, these cards, these cards, these cards. Plus, most of the units are solid already, right? On the two drop slot, you have a two two, and you have a one three that can attack as a three three. On the three drop slot, you have a five five or a two one flyer with regen. And then on the four drop slot, yeah, you're just all the way up the curve, like you mentioned, is great. Commons, right? Mostly. Uh, yeah. The crash mm -hmm. is an uncommon, I think. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's surprisingly easy to to pick up some decent stuff. And, and, and once again, you can pick up Malaga Munitions, which for some reason, that card just does more work than that you anticipate. And then, of course, you know, we say it's the tribe deck, but... That doesn't mean you're the Sentinel deck. You have nothing but Sentinels in your deck. You obviously can supplement it, much like the Valkyrie deck had Sentinels in it. You could have Valkyries in your Sentinel deck. Uh, you can... And, oh, and that's the other thing, too, is that you you get restorative... Restoration? What is it? Restoration something or other? Restor... What is it? Uh, restorative process, where for two... You essentially draw two cards that are relevant. You can get an attachment and a sentinel from your void. And man, if you have a decent sized sentinel that your opponent had to do some work to get rid of, and then you can get it back plus draw something like a worm stone or, you know, just a two one weapon or something like that. Like, gosh darn. Or you, you see this, a, a, you, you see know, this a lot. Draw card attachment. Even yeah. Value. Yeah, or you see this a lot with gloves too. You know, people getting back one of the cheaper sentinels and then getting back gloves of the pyromancer plus three plus one that you could tack onto another unit, get another fate trigger. There there there's a lot going on with this deck, and it it's pretty solid. And even if you don't quite get there and have the deck, you're still pretty happy with what you end up with. So it's one of the safer paths to go down this road for sure. But I think definitely, like you mentioned, John, having access to extremely cheap removal in the form of laser blast having Scythe to push through damage, easily taking up Conflagrate and potentially having the power to play it, and then getting a baseline 5-5 five, five for 3. But yeah, yeah. This, this this deck is doing things. No doubt about it. Yeah, Scythe uh, Slash, yeah. We've talked about it already in a previous uh, episode, but like that, that's, that card just does work, right? Like... It's one of the ways you can get in there with Basher and have it either do just an obscene amount of damage or, um, you know, it's it's a way to make make it trade for more units, right? Like, they're they're setting up a multi-block or whatever, and now suddenly all of their units died because Psy Slash. Oh, and maybe a little damage got pushed through. And also the, the Bastion Garrison and the Psy Slash, and specifically Rakano, really let you cheat on power. 
um, mm-hmm. so, so you get more goodies in your deck. Yeah, it's like the most plunder support in a deck as well. So it literally yep. lets you, like, it, the, the number of times that we're playing 15, 16 power decks, with, because, it's just because we have just an insane amount of plunder. Um, it just makes it easy to play it like that. You just, you know, it, you just always plunder your card to hit your power when you need to. And, you know, and, and then later in the game, it's just pure value because if, you, if you're sitting there with a sigil or two, somehow <laughs> you can uh, turn into a treasure um but yeah like th- i think that's the deck that that i've been able to cheat on power you know we when plunder came out we were always talking about like do you go higher or lower and i think we were always still putting in a normal amount of power and then sometimes later in the game we'd managed to just get some value well uh, th- th- this, there's enough support in like th- in these decks where the cheating is definitely happening i think yeah, I definitely had a deck where my I had one four drop in the form of Red Plate Crasher, and then I had two five drops in the form of two Send the Markets, and everything else on my curve was three and below. Yeah, so it's Rackham definitely doable. Tend to tend to stop the curve like at Send the Market, right? That's that's a usual curve topper. Yep. Yeah, I mean you can get there's some pretty powerful Valkyries and rares that you can get that will cause you to go higher. Ditro is a complete powerhouse that I haven't had the fortune of opening up yet. I've played against them, but I've, I haven't been able to play him. But um, And then, I mean, if you have a couple of Nectars of Unlife, right? If you're kind of the Argent Port version or you have some Shadow in there. Uh, Blackout the Skies. There you go. Blackout the Skies is great. Play that card. It is good. Um, I think, yeah, that card is just great. It's funny because it seems niche, but the fact that it's fast... The fact that you can amplify to get two things and the fact that, um, it, uh, one other aspect to it. I don't remember. Anywho, that card is good. (laughs) I like it. I I like at least one in any deck that I'm running shadow in. So take that for what it's worth. I I like it in the market, like a lot, a lot. Nice, yeah, I, I and that's a that's a, a fault of me. I I still am, I'm very low on the etchings, and I I like the um, the grafters, but I think the jig is up. I don't unless I open them, see them pack, pick one or pick two. I'm not really seeing them very often. So yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty bad about what identifying things to go in the market because I rarely. Like I said, that's a, that's a fault on me. I'll take that hit. I, I don't. I rarely play markets in this format right now, even though I think it's very easy to have a strong market. I, I have the opposite problem. I'm like shopping the whole time. <laughs> I know, like I did a draft with Alex. I think like last night. I, I've how many of those cards where I was like, oh, market, market. Oh, this might be good in the market. It seems like every other card. <laughs> Uh, I have really started to identify the power of some of these fate cards in the market, though. You know, any of these cards that draw you a card for having a specific kind of unit in play, um, it's a little frustrating. Uh, that's why I immediately got started to go lower on them, unless they 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 actually were a good card on their own, because it was just like I was never seeing the fate at the right time. But when you have them in the market and you can dictate when you draw them, so they trigger that fate, they get significantly better. All right, John, why don't you go ahead and break down the difference here between the synergistic decks that you can build in this format and just my personal favorite, the boring decks. Yeah, so we talked about all the tribes. And like, so the setup is like, there's a tribe and there's a theme for the tribe. And then it's like, there's a sub theme. There's there's like two or three sub themes between the two factions break down between the tribes, right? And that's all to say that stuff's all just kind of for fun more than anything. Uh, and like, you have to have so much synergy for the synergy um, payoffs to be like that powerful. Like we mentioned basically soldiers and mandrakes where that's a thing. Um, but like the decks suffer like otherwise. Right. Um, so I don't know. I- I've definitely found that, if you just, you know, just draft a normal good deck, you're just going to end up winning more games than, you know, it, it's <laughs> don't, don't get baited, I guess would be my advice. Right. Like um, in this format, there's a lot of bait. 
um and if you just if you just stick to the fundamentals you're just gonna win more games right um you can you can definitely have a lot of fun going for some synergies and stuff and you can do powerful stuff but i mean if you if if all you want is win rate right you're you're gonna want to go for the boring draft strategy um go go back going back to that pack one pick one of the day right you, it's that pack one pick one nectar of unluck or unlife <laughs> Yeah, and that's honestly what I, I feel. When I'm streaming, it's a little different, right? I'm there to entertain. I'm there to kind of experiment so people get some leg up. So I might try to go a little deeper, and that's how we did the Huru Stuns Matter deck and things like that. And I had a really sick Stone Scar sack deck. We went deep in the sack, and sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. But I think when you... The problem is, is that you start to pay... You start to make these kind of... Well, it's like a niche pick, right? This card is not as powerful. Card B is not as powerful as card A, but if, you know, card card B is better in deck XYZ versus when you take that safer pick, yeah, you might not be the quote-unquote Valkyrie deck or the Mandrake deck, but, you know, sometimes your Mandrakes will synergize and then sometimes you just have a solid Xenon deck and you're perfectly fine with that. And I think that's the easiest way to kind of safe draft and not subpar yourself. And it also keeps you open to kind of really prioritize cards. Cause I've totally done that before as well, where I'm like, okay, we're granite ends. We're looking for granite ends. And they're like, Hey, why don't you just take that perfectly fine, you know, normal card. That's good. And I was like, Oh yeah, I guess I didn't see a granite. in, so I just ignored it. Um, and, and you miss some things and some other synergies that could happen. IE when you're in felon, you could just take a razor bot slap a perfume a ghastly perfume on it and then with the natural recursion that Feld has you can get that back and get some serious value but you may not looking be looking for that if that's you know if, if you're trying to go down a specific path and whatnot uh, another thing would that would be like uh what is it the valkyrie overwatch or whatever the 2-2 Relic, what is it now? Watchwing Garrison? What is it? I gotta look it up now because it's the Kyoju Elevator or whatever. Uh, Watchwing support. Oh, Watchwing support. I'm, I'm thinking of the legendary. Um, Alex has so that in his draft deck today. Yeah, so Watchwing support. You know, when it's a two cost, two justice relic. When you play an attachment, the top unit or weapon of your deck gets plus two, plus two. Valkyrie warp add two random justice cards to your market. So of course, there if you take it, you start to kind of try to figure out. Um, how many attachments you can add to your deck to make this even better but the truth is the card is fine just by itself and even with one or two other attachments in it just because it gives a permanent plus two plus two to the next thing and then if you have one malaga munitions this thing will trigger you know twice and and just there's badge of honor so you don't have to go too deep on it where you might pass a unit that's feasible just to try to make this come together when you don't necessarily need to um, you know, you can keep prioritizing removal and make sure you have a solid curve. That's another thing that kind of slips a little bit when you're like, well, this card is is more for our deck, so let's take it. And then when you look, you're missing, you don't have enough two drops or three drops or something, or you don't have top end. And so that's why I personally like to play more towards boring decks. Plus, it stops me from being greedy and playing, right? When I'm when I'm the Mandrake deck, I, I and I have Mandrakes in my hand, I'm just like, ah, let me try to squeeze out one or two more Mandrakes before I ultimate, which could be the deciding factor in the game. Instead of just, all right, let me just fire off this ultimate here, get the value I can, but at least it's going to be the most optimal play to make. So, I don't know. Alex, what, what, where are you at on this split? I'm on the uh, boring deck side of the split. Because uh, when I try to do synergies uh, too much, it ends up biting me in the butt and a lot of wheel spinning going on and not a lot of game winning. So usually if I'm just by myself and not trying to uh, have a flashy deck, I'm just going to do the boring stuff. Mm hmm. Do you have any hot takes for the format that you're really high on or really low on as far as for your own drafts or strategies and things like that, things that stand out to you? When we talked about it a little bit, just being really open to playing less power, like kind of ingrained in me to put 18 power in the deck. And, you know, with all the plunder that's around, it's a lot easier to not 
play as much power and you get more value for the other cards in your deck. So I guess just that really. Um, primal's bad still, I guess. Haven't <laughs> really been in Primal hardly ever. Uh, Elysian, unfortunately, even though it has one of the coolest uncommons, uh, which I've I've splashed because I like that card so much. The one that the soldier that like makes, I think it makes mandrakes, which is kind of weird, right? Yeah, the two two flyer for yeah. two. Yeah, that one. Um, and then amplify three make three three mandrakes. Yeah, I mean it's still adding a three three body for three. You're perfectly fine with that somewhere yeah. anywhere on the curve. I just don't understand that card, like, uh, flavor-wise, but um, it's it's a great card and worth splashing, but um, Fire, Justice, Shadow is, is where it's at. We talked about that as well. John, do you have anything else to add? Mm, no, I think, I think that's going to do it. Sweet. All right, guys, that's our first impressions of Empire of Glass. We'll keep you guys updated as the format changes right now. It definitely, once again, Rakano is the boogeyman of the format. It's the safest way to go. Uh, there's a couple of small variations. We see people trying to go lower on the ground and a couple of people going bigger. But uh, surprisingly enough, I have not seen a lot of that 5-5 flying Valkyrie for 7. And that doesn't surprise me because I think it's just a little too slow. Um I personally am low on Valkyrie Cadet. I don't think it does enough, but I've seen play people play it to some success. So take it for what it's worth. Um, uh, yeah, and that's about it. So sweet. That takes us into our constructed corner, which we are going to be talking about a spicy little brew that John took to Tuesday Night Eternal. And uh, John being one of our resident brewers. Uh, real quick, this one is called Cool Cruel. And it is without campaign cards, roughly 46,500 shift stone. And uh, John, I'll go ahead and go through the list and then you can break it down for us. And it's uh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to go through the list anymore because people always say I go through fast anyways. And what are they going to do? Like write it down while they're listening to us at work or whatever. So why don't you just go ahead? I'll have it on screen. You guys can check it out on YouTube or you can check out the list. I'll have the link in the show notes down below so you can check that out. Uh, John, why don't you talk about this overall strategy of this deck and what you got going on? Sure. So it's a it's a a draw deck, draw ascending, and it's a cruel deck, right? Kind of smashed together. Um, so because it's a draw deck, it's basically a mono primal deck. Um, in this case, it's Huru because there's um some justice cards we want to play, a little interaction in just desserts. Um, but it's basically a primal deck. And we cheat out, um, you know, Cruel. Uh, we use Cruel to, like, reanimate stuff for free because Cruel's a busted card. Um, if you've played any constructed in either format, you've played with or against Cruel. It has a busted fate ability, which basically says when you draw them, you take damage equal to your remaining power, and um, you can reanimate the unit from your void uh, up to that amount of power. Um, so it's a super powerful effect, but it comes at a cost, which is your own life. Um, so you got to be careful with that. I, I, I put out a, a juicy highlight, killing myself with Cruel during the Tuesday Night Eternal tournament this week. It was, it was a good one. Um, and I, I didn't even need to do it. I just misplayed. But <laughs> it's easy to do with this deck. It's a really tough one to pilot. It's super fun to play, though. Um, and with a nut draw, you can actually kill people kind of out of nowhere, like on turn five and six. Because another thing you're doing is playing Near Perfect Imitation, which is a five-cost spell that no one's really played much of um, in any of my games. Um, but it's like a weird, powerful reanimator spell comparable to Grasping with Shadows. Um, except this one's Primal. And instead of taking the unit from your Void, it actually transforms one of your units already in play into a unit that's already in your Void. So the idea of this deck... We have a lot of enablers on the low end that, you know, do some loot effect, like draw a card, discard a card, or Whispering Wind in particular, which lets you uh, discard specific cost cards from your hand and then get a, a higher cost card. So as a result of that as well, the deck is built with um, fours, fives, sixes, sevens, eights, and actually goes all the way up to nine. Um, because, you know, when you discard an eight drop, then you're guaranteed to get a nine kind of thing with Whispering Wind. 
And we're playing three of Saviors of the Meek, which is a card that you've probably never seen played because it's a nine cost um, seven seven flying lifesteal um, with another uh, four. Sorry, go for, for it. the record. Myself and Gato Sujo tried making it work. It just never worked out for us. Oh, you did? Yeah, I totally. I like this card when it was spoiled. I liked it. And I totally tried to make it work. And yeah, <laughs> oh. I mean, it just dies to annihilate. Like, that's honestly how it would play out. Annihilate's Anyways, not continue. In the right now. <laughs> right? So oh, expedition. but send an agent is. Yeah, send an agent is. Um, so, right. So, if you're playing against like a Xenon deck, you got to be aware of send an agent, obviously. If you're playing, you know, it, anytime you could get dazzled, you got you to gotta not just open yourself up to things like that when you're playing this deck, obviously, um, because that kind of stuff can happen. But so the reason why Savior the Meek is so good is because it's a nine drop, so you can kind of keep going over six, seven, and eight. And then it also puts a unit in play with a fate trigger, which you need a unit to, you know, for near perfect imitation to do its thing. So you actually can end up turning this 1-1 one, one Watchman into a Savior of the Meek itself, which is hilarious. Um, but, like, the best play to do is to, you know, do a Vara Limitless, right? We're playing Vara Limitless in this deck uh, without any Primal. Um, or, sorry, not Primal, Shadow. To cast her, just, she's a reanimate. She's, like, the perfect card to reanimate with Near Perfect Imitation um, because as long as the unit that you transform was in play before your turn, it basically, you know, it doesn't have charge because it was in play the prior turn, but like, you know, it transforms and it can already attack. Right. So it's like Vara is an attack trigger ability for reanimation. Uh, when she attacks, play a unit from your void. Um, so you can basically attack with Vara the turn you do it, which means she can put another unit into play immediately, which that can get out of hand. And if you got both Varas, like one in the void, one in play, it's kind of got this redundancy going on where you don't even care if they answer your first Vara. Um, it also puts a Vara, um, like, it, it keeps the one, um, I, I don't know, it, it's a really tricky deck. <laughs> you got you to play with it a bunch to kind of figure out all the tricky lines and stuff. But, you know, generally speaking, you want to, like, pitch... A, over a couple turns things into things to the whispering wind and whatnot to kind of curate your void in a way um so yeah we also have a single helio uh which can be reanimated with vara um or cruel as long as you uh can take the hit of six life from the cruel um and that just refills your hand like crazy because we're basically playing mono primal um then we got other you know, draw and discard enablers um, in Wisdom and Forbidden Research in Torgov. Um, and then you got removal slash plunder slash, you know, amazing unit, Mavloft Huntress. Um, goes great with Kroll, uh, just for, you know, two power available means you can kill things. Um, goes great with Savior the Meek because a lot of times, even on turn two, you'll already have that extra one one in play which means you can kill something just a little bit bigger and sometimes that matters a lot um so yeah just generally speaking you're you're committing to the board while curating your void while <laughs> while, get, while setting up this big reanimation play um and occasionally you'll turn one fetch the one of speaking circle like i did this in the tournament where it was a matchup where i knew the opponents relying on curving out into speaking circle um, which is the busted site with the text, the enemy player can't have a site. So in the, in that matchup, it's so important to be the one that curves out in a speaking circle. One thing you can do is to know when to hold them, turn one, just get just cha change that know when to hold them into that one of speaking circle. So we're playing the the four of know when to hold them, which means a lot of these one ofs are in a lot of ways five ofs. You know, the, that's why it doesn't matter so much that there's only like one speaking circle, one Helio, two Vars, because um, you don't always know when to hold them for Kroll in this deck. A lot of times you'll do it for the savior to get the body in play and the thing for the void, or you'll do it and get the Vara because it doesn't matter um, with this deck. The whole thing with no one to hold them, that it, the card that you fetch can't be played for five turns. That doesn't matter when you're doing near perfect imitation reanimation. Um, because you're actually 
the way it's worded. You're transforming a unit in play into a copy of one in your void. And so it doesn't it doesn't matter um, that text on no one to hold because you're not playing the unit. You're you're kind of getting around the downside with this whole strategy, right? So <laughs> it's it's just it's a really tricky deck to play. Um, it's really fun, and you can just kind of kill people out of nowhere sometimes. <laughs> um, and I, I got to say, I'm also working on a few other versions. I'm working on a film version, a Xenon version for Expedition. Uh, I worked on basically a version of this deck for the team tournament today that Ash played um, with Ash, and it was really sweet. It's playing super powerful cards, you know, the traditional reanimator, reanimator cards like Big Vara and Azendel, but we're also playing like... Uh, Jex because of the whole Whispering Wind package and that version. So there's a lot of brewing potential here. So like if nothing else, uh, I hope that this um, sparks some creativity and some more brewing, right? And this is actually like I, I think there's something here. Like this isn't all the way tuned yet, and uh, I just ran into a ton of you know Genitor Dovid decks, uh, right? Like Huru Soldiers is is very strong right now. So needs to be kind of retuned against the new menace that's been released and then we're getting a new set uh i'm sure we'll talk talk a little bit about you know on this or another podcast coming up that just got announced as well um where the whole meta will change and who knows if it'll be good then but right now it's sweet it's a playable deck um uh and yeah if you happen to have a bunch of saviors of the meek i recommend tr giving it a try <laughs> otherwise it's it's a tough ass to craft saviors of the meek and i'm not gonna lie about that Nice. Well, thanks for sharing that. It, it was fun watching you play it. I really enjoyed it. I think it's a spicy brew for sure, but that's one of the things you're known for. Thanks. Yeah, I, lo I love spicy brews, and I, I don't I don't mind going out there and, and just trying them out. I, you know, I who cares if you lose some games, right? <laughs> All right, then. That's going to do it for our Constructed Corner. So we have one last segment going into our listener questions. Uh, we had a you know, we it's been we have three we have three lined up because we did our set reviews and obviously we wanted to try to limit extra things on those shows because they're so long. So first up, we have a listener question from Mercurial Blue, and this is I redeemed a question: How do you manage to stream Eternal for more than three hours and still maintain focus and attention? Well, the easy answer is, is I don't maintain focus. You guys catch me misplaying all the time because I'm sitting there interacting with chat and I'm like, oh yeah, that thing did have endurance. Oh, like when did they play this? So <laughs> there's that, but I do enjoy it. Uh, streaming four hours is about good for me. I think anything more than that, I feel like I'm spending too much time talking nonstop. So I get a little tired. Um, I do have a desk, the one of the, the you know, elevator telescoping desks so i am able to stand up and move around a little bit while still streaming and stuff but i just straight up enjoy it like honestly i think this game is a ton of fun i really enjoy playing it on all of its formats and then i have like chat's great our community is fantastic i get to sit here and kick it with my friends and hang out and crack jokes and talk about things eternal when we're all trying to get better we have a bunch of new players coming in asking a bunch of questions and i think it's great getting them into the game as well so, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. I, I, I make sure I pick a schedule that works for me. I mean, I did adjust my schedule and our recording day and whatnot to make sure it, it, I don't feel taxed by it. Um, but yeah, I, that, I just enjoy it a lot. I think it would probably be a little bit more difficult if I couldn't, but find a schedule that works for you. Know what your limitations are and and just kind of take it from there and don't be afraid to, to adjust things a little bit but i think the community is what really makes streaming feasible overall uh next up we have cassandrith and it is to talk about all the best parts of sunset priest so sunset priest is a pretty amazing card especially in limited formats we are seeing it creep into constructed with reanimator but in limited, it's great because it's a 3-3. Three, three. It is a 3-3 three, three body for 3 with only a single shadow influence, which already makes it easy to go into any deck uh, to fit the curve as just a plain old 3-3 three, three for 3. You're perfectly fine with that. Uh, it is, I believe it's a cultist, right? Let me look it up yep. real quick. Yeah, so not really a big deal in this current format, but it is an elf and it is a cultist, which in previous formats and tribes, we've seen that matter, both versions of that. So that is extremely uh, important as well. That, once again, based on the meta, what we're seeing in the draft packs and the constructive uh, 
or in the uh, actual format packs will dictate on whether that is good. But it has. Cultist was really the bigger one because that interacted with the Void a little bit more than Elves do. But Elves did buff each other and things like that. So that made it extremely viable as well. And then finally, the Summon Effect. Each player discards the top three cards of their deck. This is solid because we've seen various cards that care about how many cards are in your opponent's Void. And we have obviously seen self-mill decks that value... Uh, throwing cards into your void is essentially drawing them if you have enough recursion or we care about what's in your void or even discarding matters as is something we're seeing now with mandrakes where they actually care about when cards are being discarded so it's kind of using all parts of the buffalo here um discarding increasing your enemy void is going to turn on some of your mandrakes both the uh, man eater one that we talked about earlier as well as spore splitter giving it unblockable uh turning on uh, there's uh, some other cards some primal cards deal more damage or give you a bonus when your opponent has more cards in their void and then as well as um obviously putting stuff in your void that'll fuel your shoal dredgers and give you turning those triumphant returns and dark returns and things like that more powerful by having more options in the void uh did i miss anything guys on sunset priest i've never heard you say so many nice things about sunset priest before i mean i don't like the card but <laughs> I, i'm i I'd, I'd be doing the the public a disservice by you know letting my opinion change what the value of the card is it's, it's good it should be in it's most decks yeah, it's never looked better than in this format pretty much even even when it had like cultist synergies in a prior format it's like yeah that just it, same what you just mentioned that other the the four that four four mandrake like that th that's better than ever in this format too it's like because people are kind of milling themselves as well as there being some ways to mill them it's like more consistent than ever as far as those, it, those threshold payoffs yeah, and it gets buffed by the other other mandrake, so it could potentially be even bigger. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not wrong. Right. Yeah, Sunset Priest is a uh, is a decent card these days. And finally, our last one comes from our very own Cal Shadow Step from the Eternal Journey team, and this is while obviously it doesn't apply to every draft format. To what degree do you think time is fundamentally stronger than other factions in draft because its core design principle is being better stat rates? for cost than the other factions uh i think the short answer to this is time is strong when there is less removal and interaction in the format i think when there is more clean just kill a unit then the stat line doesn't matter as much because it's going to remove the unit regardless when there's less interaction like that and your opponent has to burn a unit and a combat trick or triple block to get your unit you know or they're there they have to double block with their three drop and their four drop to take care of your four or five drop uh, or you you know your three and four drops are road blocking them i think when those things start to happen in the format i think that's when you see time being the best statted units for their cost really start to capitalize and when you have that kind of stat boost all the way up the curve when you're playing a three five for three and then a four five for four and then a five six for five or you know that's when you're really starting to just essentially have pseudo virtual card advantage because even though you're you and your opponent are spending the same amount of power you're adding a lot more to the board than they are uh, another aspect of the fact of time is that it is able to ramp. So going back to that less removal, if there's less ways for them to remove your ramp spells, whether it's a unit or a relic, then being able to get ahead on the curve, and if you're on the play, you're essentially two turns ahead of your opponent, is where we start to see time to really kind of step, push past the other... Um, the other factions when you're able to start attacking with a big unit and your opponent has to decide on whether they tap out to play whatever the unit is on their curve or they have to essentially throw off their curve to attempt to get that unit off the board is when time really starts to shine as well uh, anything you'd like to add about when time is stronger because of its unit stats alex um you pretty much covered why it's good i mean 
a time, I guess, not talking about the units, a lot of times is a color that's going to facilitate splashing. So that's another reason that I'm in time and think it's a very good color and always a playable color. Um, but you hit the nail on the head as far as if there's more removal, then it, it makes the units be not as good. But um, I still, time's a good solid color. It's just not the best one in this format, which is fine. Yeah, yeah, I think every every faction deserves their little light in the sun, time in the sun for sure. I mean, that's what makes these draft formats fun. John, anything to add on this? Yeah, you, I think it was interesting the way you talked about it in light of removal, right? Because what, in like one of the last formats where time was like probably the best was Grodov's favored, where like the reason it was it was so good is the removal was silence, right? And when you silence a big time unit, it's still just a big time unit. Um. So it's kind of resilient to that, right? So that's when it seems like very good point, right? So that's when like time is maybe the best faction in a format like that. And like, so the basic question here, thinking talking about time being fundamentally stronger because its principles better stats for its cost, I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think it's it's on average, I think its stats are actually a little. It's like right on par or even lower than what you'd expect for the cost, but because time. Uh, I think throughout more like when I think of time I think of you guys mentioned both ramp and fixing like that's what I think of when I think of time decks and draft um, and so because it's ramp it lets you play the big statted unit maybe a turn ahead of time making it seem like it's better stats for the cost or something I don't know but like I don't think that's a thing that time really has like yeah that's a thing that some time cards have but like in my mind, they're like legendaries, like Sandstorm Titan. That's not a draft card, you know? So in the in the sense of draft, I don't agree with this basic assumption about time, right? For me, time in draft is the faction of ramp, and it's it's the function of, like, power, right? Both ramp and, and, and splashing. So, I don't know. <laughs> nice. I like that. I like that breakdown, dude. Well said. Okay. Thanks. That's why we have you on the show. You're the smartest one of the three of us. Hey, you keep saying that, but I don't know that that's really true. You guys are, you guys are great. <laughs> great doesn't really confirm the smartest thing, but that's all right. <laughs> Moving right along. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us on this First Impressions. Uh, we will continue to give you as much information as we can so you continue to have fun in this format and uh, evolve with it. And much like John said, we'll probably in the next couple weeks talk about this bundle that they're going to release. No campaign, just straight up bundle. So pay money, get new cards, ta-da, with uh, some sick rewards. Make sure you guys are on the lookout for that. You can catch videos of this podcast as well as drafts at youtube.com slash eternal journey. And of course, catch me streaming live every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday at twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ. If you'd like to talk to us offline, Check us out at the Discord link down below where we have ourselves as well as various other people that are willing to help you draft, seal pool, build seal pools, and do constructed stuff and just overall help you with the game or chat about your day. That's going to do it, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out. We'll see you next week. But until then, as always, happy gaming. Good night. Good luck in your draft cues, everyone.